Today, Voices from Oxford is talking to a very interesting economist who is also interested in the history and geography of cities. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Ferdinand Rauch, a fellow at Brasenose College here in the University of Oxford. Now, Dr. Rauch, What's fascinating about your work is that you're first of all combining three different disciplines, the geography of cities, the history of cities, and the economics of cities, and a fourth, really, the statistics of all of those. Now, what can you tell us about the history aspect of cities? So I study the size, location, and growth rate of cities. Where are cities? Why is London where it is? Where is Oxford where it is? Um, the, the growth rate of people, which cities grow, which, people, uh, which cities don't grow, and what forces can explain all that. Yes. And uh, so you could think of a natural experiment to find out if these are economic processes or just random processes. Right. And an ideal experiment might be, we could, an economist might think maybe the economy of Britain is the way it is because it ought to be that way for economic reasons, right. access to rivers, coal mines, airports, yes. markets, and yes. so on. So the ideal experiment might be to take everybody out of Britain, erase the country, and then put everybody back in at random points and see, and what see if, they found, and if they form cities in the same places with yes. the same relative size or not. Yes. And so in, in some of my work, I have looked for events in history that are a bit like that. Right. And what this, this is a larger literature that studies the bom burning of cities, bombing of cities in wars, right. destruction of cities by illnesses and so on, what the literature tends to conclude is that cities are very resilient. If they're destroyed, they grow back very so fast. Dresden gets rebuilt. Indeed. Yes. Or if you look at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the two cities hit by a nuclear exactly. bomb, yes. they grow back on trend within decades, yes. so that you couldn't even see the nuclear bomb if you only had data from exactly. before and yes. a bit after. Yes. So what does destroy cities then? What we find is we find a counterexample to this resilience, yes. but only one. By studying European history, yeah. we looked at Iron Age settlements, Roman cities, medieval cities, modern cities, all of it, and we studied various shocks. The one big shock that managed to alter the map substantially was the end of the Roman Empire. In right. So, 1,500 years ago, Indeed. and then the cities are more or less in the same places? No, they, they were founded in different places. Right, but... What had happened is yes. that... the. the Roman cities in Britain were founded by the Roman army, which didn't use ships much north of the Mediterranean. They built roads, they built the cities along the roads, both in Britain and in France. Uh, what, when the Roman Empire collapsed, uh, in Britain it collapsed completely. Cities abandoned, there was no economic activity that we can measure today. The society reverted back to hunter-gatherers from the 3rd to the 6th century. While in France, urban continuity persisted during right. this time. Right. And what we can see is, in the 6th century, when cities in Britain re-establish, they yes. are founded near waters, at the rivers and at the coasts. So they became the more sort of geographically logical. <laughs> While the French continue to, towns be continue to be stuck in the places where that are suboptimal yes. from today's perspective. Yes. Right. And as a consequence, the English cities grew more than the French cities. And that might explain why the British population growth in cities has been greater than in France by about 20% right. over these uh, 1,500. So a single major event, well, one says a single event, but an event that occurred over what is just a few decades, which is the collapse of the Roman Empire, and that occurring more completely in Britain than in France, in effect explains modern distribution of cities in Europe. It does. It, it Extraordinary. Gave, it gave England the freedom to build its cities yes. closer to the fundamentals. Yes. The big message is that many cities are probably stuck in bad places, in as in France, because cities are extremely resilient, yes. locked in bad equilibria, perhaps. Yes, I see. And yes. it takes a big, big shock that perhaps it's a, it's a very extreme shock. The, a smaller shock might do it too, but we show a sufficiently extreme shock, which yes. requires probably erasing the map completely plus changing locational yes. fundamentals in a major way. Right. Now, let me bring you up to date now, because you've also got a fascinating study of London, which comes to some very interesting counterintuitive conclusions. Tell us about your tube study. So I not only study cities from the outside, but also yeah. sometimes go, as the field does, into cities and try to understand yes. what happens within this city. 
And what I did there with, with a few co-authors is we looked at the Oyster Card data right. that people use on the London Underground Network. Got They've got yes. one too. I can show the camera. Yes. I think I've got one. Yes. Yes, yes exactly. So yes. this is the ticket yes. to every English um, person. Every Londoner knows uh, this. And even outside London, they have <laughs> them, yes. And this is, you use this to get in and out of the underground uh, or buses in London. Right. And it records when you get on the tube, what time you do at what station. And it records when you get off at what right. time at what station. Sure. And it has an ID, so I can track cards over time. So you know where everybody was, <laughs> where, where, yes. was according to their Oyster number at least. I don't know and where they, they are, went to. No, that's parts. right. But you, yes. Okay. So you don't have personal data exactly. on them. Exactly. But you, you know how, where they went to how, how often. Exactly, that's on. right. Yes. And it's a very, very big data set. So what was your experiment? More than three and, <laughs> more than three and a half million Oyster cards in the system right. every day right. and over uh, 50 million observations on, a, on some yes. days. Right. And, and so we, it's, with big data, it's always the problem how to distill it into a useful message. Yes. Yes. And here we had a, a beautiful natural experiment in the form of a strike. A tube strike. A tube strike. Yes. Where some stations in central London were closed and other stations were left open. Yes. Which means that we look at commuters who go from every morning to work. Yeah. Some had to do, look for a different route. Yes. So some people were forced to experiment. And what we, the question we ask is, if you were forced to search for a different route, what is the probability that you stick to the new route? I see. And if you do that, we conclude probably your original route had not been optimal. Indeed, yes. Because when we force you to switch, you yes. switch. Yes, right. And, and what do you, we, what we do you, find that you around find? 5% of people yes. seem to do this. So they seem to not go on the optimal route to work. Right, right. But by this revealed preference argument. Yes. And on the new routes, the observed travel time is indeed about half a minute shorter. Yes. But we don't know how long they take to walk to the station and from the and station. But so what we yes. observe is indeed also shorter. Yes, right. So that relates to economic models, which often assume that people are acting rationally in the conditions in which they're operating. What you're saying, that's not always true. Exactly. It's very hard to square this finding with, yes. to rationalize this finding with a model of economic yes. rationality. Right. On the other hand, you could say it's only 5%. So 95% right, maybe do yes, what, yes. what we think. But those 5% might be the ones who upset the apple cart in terms of prediction, mightn't they? But there's another aspect to this that I, I think I'd like to finish with. You must have had to do an enormous amount of calculation yes. statistics that's here. Right. And that's another way, area where you're very strong, that's isn't right. it? Yes, so that's, yes. economics is becoming very much an empirical field. And that's also what I do, work with big data sets and analyze them, trying to spot trends and patterns. Right. May I make one last remark on Please. this? Please, yes. That I didn't mention. We also have some information on the mechanism that generates this behavior. Yes, what do you think are, is happening? Well, we can explain part of it by distortions in the tube map. Which oh is my goodness! Built to reflect the geography of London. So people take notice of those nice, neat circles and straight indeed. lines, indeed. and they don't realize that some distances are a lot shorter than indeed. they appear. Yes. Yes. And if pe people who live or work in an area with big distortions are more likely to not be on the optimal route. Indeed, yes. I've got. I've made that mistake myself, getting out at one tube station and finding just how long it took to get to the next one just by walking. But Dr. Rao, your, your work is fascinating and thank you so much for talking thank to Voices from Oxford. Thank you.